Cool. All right. So as we mentioned, we're lucky to have uh, Eric here today, a 3D technical artist. Uh, I did a ton of work in 3D commerce with Wayfair, now with DGG, with Max and team. They've been doing GLTF and Open Standards for a decade. Some awesome work around optimizing models for deployment on the web. Uh, Eric, thank you for, for volunteering to give the education session uh, last time. Uh, so looking forward to um, to your talk and the Q&A. What we're doing with materials workflow. So um, so a bit about me. Um, uh, work at DGG, I've been here for about a year, um, and I am the product owner for a couple of different pieces of software, and I'll show what those are. And um, well, I've been in Kronos Group calls for about seven years uh, before this, I was at Wayfair for a while, leading their 3D team there and growing, which is mostly about rendered stuff, but we also did interactive real-time export. And then before that, I was in game art. Oh, and the, the stuff on the right there is all contributions I've made to the GLTF sample assets repo over time. Uh, so GGG, you know, as, uh, as Patrick said, we've been around for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a startup. Um, Formerly, it was Rapid uh, Compact, but this year we uh, reorganized things into uh, kind of a more um, combined structure and all, all the tools work together and a redoing of the schema so that it's a lot more amenable to more automation control. And really, that's kind of the, the core and the, the, um, the core uh, capability of DGG is that we're uh, creating automation and for large enterprises and small companies as well. And we've been a part of GLTF contributing for, for quite a while. Uh, so our basic platform has these three basic tool lines. The 3D processor on the left is kind of the core, and that's what Rapid Compact was. Um, and it's you know an optimizer and converter and has its own internal material format, just as most 3D tools do. You've got to ingest the materials and represent them in your own way and then uh, spit them out after you process them. Uh, in the middle there is the DCC import, and that's what I'll talk about a bit about today. And then on the right, we have this QC tools thing, which automates the quality control of, uh, of things for our customers and for us so that you can run large batch runs of, of 3D model processing and then see the results of how it works. And so DCC import is basically this. It's it, We're taking these complex material graphs that you see on the left there, and converting them into PBR uh, so that they can be used in GLTF and USDZ and other formats. Uh, and it's basically this whole distillation process of how do we preserve the artist's intent what, that was originally used in the path tracer and uh, make it available for rasterizers and, and other uses. Uh, and so I'll just play a short video here. This is uh, a model inside of 3ds Max. Uh, courtesy of the 3D coat people, and I recreated the materials in V-Ray. So we currently support Max and V-Ray as a material structure, but we also support Modo. Um, and here I'm archiving the scene, basically sending it out as a zip file with all of its texture assets, and then going to our cloud platform and uploading the zip file. And then you can choose a few options for the conversion process itself about what things you want it to do. Uh, and then it's a little sped up here, but it's basically it converts the scene by baking what needs to be baked and just converting what doesn't need to be baked um, and then presents you the, the real-time output uh, as a GLTF embed. And you can change the scale of the asset, which really matters for, say, AR use or embedding with other items. Uh, and then the 3D processor side is the optimizer that optimizes and converts it into different formats. So there it's converting into a GLB and a USDZ. And then you can create an embed and basically uh, make it so that you can uh, publish something on the web. And that's kind of what the QR code goes to, which uh, you can actually view it in AR and, and see it on your phone, whether you have an Android or uh, an Apple device. And so there it is just loading the asset. Uh, this is on an Android, I think, uh, but basically it's just an AR. So that's the conversion from V-Ray into, uh, into uh, PBR Live and a USDZ and a, and a GLB. 
Uh, so the, the whole thing it supports basically, yeah, converting from 3ds Max and Moto currently an output to a bunch of different formats and different material structures that we support through our 3D processor. Uh, and it supports a whole bunch of GLTF extensions, and we're adding more extensions as things go along. So uh, basically, we divide the scene as we're processing it into different material complexities. So like outlined in blue in the image there, those materials have no inputs. They're just values. So that's just a simple conversion across from whatever V-Ray standard is into a, a PBR standards. Uh, simple baking, which is the green block there, is, yeah, if it has textures that we can preserve the tiling information, then we do that. We we bake that in a simple fashion um, such that it's local to the texture space. Uh, but if it has more complex blending, uh, say, 3D procedural textures and things that are geometry dependent and a whole bunch of complex blending operations, then we bake down to uh, AOVs or render elements and combine those together in order to generate um, PBR compliant outputs. And this is kind of how it fits kind of into our pipeline that on the left there, we start with the DCC and the, those materials and we run it through the importer and spits out uh, converted files that are not compressed, they're lossless basically, but they are converted into PBR formats. It's just, uh, you know, PNG 24-bit files or 16-bit or um, EXR files. Um, and then you can use a 3D processor to actually convert that down into something that's much more portable. And then we also plan a whole bunch of future support. So currently working on Blender support and Material X. Uh, and then we're looking at open PPR and Keyshot and more Moto integration, Cinema and Maya, and basically just ways to get really complex materials blended down so that they can work in uh, real time. Oh yeah, and so the QC tools thing that I talked about earlier, that's basically our automated process that lets us make sure that, that our conversions are actually working properly. Uh, and we can compare different material models. So like in the bottom right, we can compare GLTF and USDZ at renders within our existing system. Uh, in the bigger window on the upper right there, that's showing the whole like QC process and that you can have multiple inputs. So if you run like hundreds of thousands of assets, you can filter down to say, oh, I just want to see the ones that failed. Um, and that way you can see which things need to be fixed or, or um, drill down into specific materials to see what's going on. So I guess the meat of this talk really is what are the challenges that we've run into? Uh, and that's kind of where the exciting stuff is. So uh, one of the things that one of our customers asked for was, how can we convert from IOR, uh, people using really high IOR values, which is kind of a legacy workflow for generating metallic surfaces in V-Ray, uh, and how can we convert that down to metallic? And, and that was probably one of the biggest challenges we have to deal with because people use, well, V-Ray basically offers this wide open toolbox of tools that you can generate surfaces, uh, whatever you desire, which means you can do all kinds of things that aren't really PBR compliant or, or aren't easy to distill down. Um, so there are things like, you know, they'll do a color diffuse, but they'll make it super high IOR and a, a non-color reflection. You know, how do you combine that together to generate a metallic value? Because usually metallic uses the base color as the color of the metal. So we have to make some, some choices about what is the artist's intent here? And how did, did they intend this to be metal or just to be super shiny dielectric? Uh, one of the other ones is uh, kind of Fresnel nodes. So people will stick what's called a fall off in 3ds Max into arbitrary places in their material tree. And you know, V-Ray allows that, which is great, a lot of flexibility, but also again, you know, having arbitrary Fresnel inputs, even like in a bump channel, which it doesn't make any sense, but people do it and we've seen it through all the assets that we've run. Uh, and so we try to do an intelligent down conversion. Basically what we do is we, when we're baking down uh, a complex tree, we'll replace these fall off nodes with a, a mix of the, the facing and the, the side colors. 
in order to kind of approximate what the input of that node would have been if it was baked down into something that's texture based. Uh, and that's a constant uh, challenge to, to figure out what's the right mix there. And we can't get it 100%, but what's the closest we can get to the artist's intent that they were trying to get and make it work in a, in a PBR rasterizer. Uh, another thing is triangle output. Like right now, GLTF is triangle based only. We've been talking about adding polygonal support through an extension uh, so that you know you could support say um, subdivision surfaces and uh, displacement and you know easier translation between editing tools, that kind of thing. Uh, but right now, you know, it's it's triangle based. So uh, we we basically the, the reason for with DCC importer why we put out triangles is because we need often an atlas or a UV that's all in zero one space in order to bake that material down. Um, and if the model doesn't have an atlas already, well, we need to generate it on an extra UV and then bake from the original UVs into that. And to do that, we use our 3D processor, which generates that lightning fast. But now we're looking at how can we generate that inside the DCC itself? Uh, and that comes up with all kinds of problems, like whether it's super slow or whether you have a ton of nodes and that slows things down or whether there are bizarre transforms. So in 3ds Max or Maya or any of these DCCs, people can use negative scale on objects. They can use non-uniform scales. All kinds of crazy things happen uh, that we have to account for. And we want to basically preserve the original intent of the model. So we don't want to change the original when we're baking the textures out of it, but we still have to operate on that asset in order to generate UVs for it. So it's a constant challenge about how do we support that. And it's, it's gotten a lot better over time, which is great to see. Uh, and then gamma, yeah, so V-Ray's material system, again, because it's node-based and each bitmap node can have its own gamma settings. Well, you need to preserve that original intent, whether the person was using, you know, 2.2 uh, for a, a, a texture, like a specular value, where it really should be a linear value or not, you know, using 1.0 for a color value or, you know, all those kinds of things, those need to kind of be preserved when you're combining your AOVs together and baking things down properly. Um, and then let's see, oh yeah, multi-material baking. So when you have material assignments per triangle on the same geometry, but have different materials assigned, uh, when you're ray casting to bake those those material trees down, uh, sometimes 3ds Max and other tools will actually cast a little bit outside of the triangles. Even if you set the ray cast to be an infinitesimal amount, it'll still cast a little bit of neighboring objects. So that's something that we had to deal with is how do we isolate the only the faces that we want to operate on, but still work in the model space so that we don't change the scale. So for example, uh, when something has a bizarre transform, but it has a, a 3D procedural on it, well, the artist's intent is what they're seeing, what you see is what you get, even though it's a bizarre transform and maybe squashed. Um, we don't want to reset that before we bake because well, we want to preserve that intent. So it means working kind of within those, those uh, constraints. And then another thing we're looking at is improving opacity fallback. So when we convert from GLTF to USDZ uh, and the, say the GLTF has transmission extension, transmission extension supports colored surfaces, um, say colored glass, like the green balls on top there. But when you're using opacity or alpha values, alpha coverage, you uh, kind of lose that the more transparent a surface gets, you get less color. But it doesn't really preserve the artist's intent. So we're looking at ways to bias that conversion to decrease the transparency for an alpha output such that it still preserves those color values in a way that's you know uh, similar to what the source material is. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is uh, roughness values and how roughness with transmission changes the apparent opacity of the object because it's it's less easy to see through. But when you convert to alpha, again, you may not have a roughness value, you may not have a 
uh, rendered a texture for that um, that renderer to support that. So are there ways to support that? I'm kind of skeptical because, you know, if you have a blue background behind transmission, well, that's going to be pulled into those rough surfaces and then it colorizes the surface and you, you can't really um, uh, prepare for that in the surface. Uh, but we're looking at, you know, what, what are ways that we can support that? And then the last one is uh, opacity and specular. Uh, so in Quick Look with USDZ, you can get a, you, you see a, a stronger specular on really transparent surfaces. And that's to kind of get kind of a glass effect um, w within the limitations of alpha blending. So how can we support that better in our uh, conversions and make that work in other renderers as well? Um, and uh, yeah, so the last kind of future thinking thing is how can we support uh, Material X? And we're actively working on uh, getting support for that. So. Uh, and it's basically we want to preserve, you know, as everyone here is quite well aware, preserve the hierarchy of the material tree as best as possible. There are a lot of challenges there for DCCs can combine uh, atomic nodes together into one single node. Um, so you kind of have to break that apart and figure out how that translates. Um, but, you know, it opens up a whole lot of uh, possibilities in terms of, you know, compression. Um, uh, translation and, and how to support variants. So that's basically it. I kind of blazed through those, but uh, really wanted to uh, get some time for Q&A and make sure that other people have time too. No, that's, look, that was awesome timing. I think really good context. I have some questions, but who, who has the first question? Oh yeah, there's some stuff in chat here. So, uh, so Nick asked, are bug reports on opacity being fill, filed? The discrepancies are a bug, not a feature. Yeah, we should file those. That's a good point. Um, I don't know if we have or not. And I don't know if there are bugs as much as features maybe. That's a good question. It's probably worth interacting to see what's going on there. So Eric, if I could ask, so you mentioned you have a like an internal material uh, system and then you, you map to and from it. Do you think with a move to material X, do you think could material X potentially even replace what you're using internally? Well, as I understand it, material X is a way to organize the nodes within your material, but not really the the BSDF or the BRDF that you're going to use to represent the material itself. So probably something more akin to open PBR, but I think ultimately we're probably support more things than open PBR allows. Um, like for example, when we added ASM support for Adobe standard material, they had a lot of things that go beyond GLTF, for example. So it's kind of our material system was originally based on GLTF, but then we added things over time as you know new extensions came out and as we need to support things for USD and USDZ, uh, FBX and others. So uh, I think ultimately, just as it is for everyone else, you kind of have to support uh, a base set of what's common, which open PBR, you know, looks to be really strong for that, but also tack on the additional things that you need for additional formats. So ultimately, I think each engine has to have, really has to have their own internal structure that supports what targets they need to support for their clients. I don't know, I would love to hear other opinions on that. It's fascinating to me. Other thoughts on that, Neil? Yeah, from my perspective, I think what you can do with Material X, at least in, um, in USD, is having uh, fallbacks that target specific renderers, and then you have like the specific uh, PBR models of those renderers filled with a mix of the same data and where they differ different data. So you can have Arnold specific graphs in there that Arnold's going to use, and you can have um, others in there that are going to be used by other renderers. So I think that is one way, but it's it's still not 
what I think everyone would like to see in terms of interoperability. It's more like, okay, yeah, we can make this compatible with a lot of effort, uh, with a lot of different systems, but then we gain having the specifics. So it's a, it's a complicated trade-off. Yeah, and it, and it probably bloats the files as well, right? If you're aiming for uh, something that's transmissible to an end client versus a uh, translation format. And that's another discussion, right? Yeah, exactly. Because currently DGD is focused on uh, output formats for the web or for a yeah, quick look. And uh, maybe in the future, even more, if you support subdivision surfaces, it can become a, a translation and archiving um, generator. Yeah, great, great stuff to hear about uh, your your plans with Material X and uh, sub sub D. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I guess that really depends upon the overall community and whether people embrace that or not. I mean, there are tons of discussions right now on that in 3D formats and elsewhere in the Kronos group uh, and elsewhere to figure out, you know, what's the best way to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, as I said before, DGG has been very committed and, and um, to uh, open source formats because our customers keep asking for it, right? Ways to make things more interoperable. So, so yeah, we keep following those developments and figure out where that fits with our roadmaps and what our clients want. And that's what makes sense. Uh, Neil had his hand up. Well, following on from that, my no, this is my normal question. If you were master of the universe for a day and you could have one thing in GLTF and one thing in USDZ to make your life easier and what you're trying to do, what, what, what would you do? What would you have? magically appear in both of those yeah i would if if i could wave a wand i would say everyone uses one format but that's not possible um but yeah i would say uh, get gltf working everywhere because it has a lot but then again you know usdz has a lot of features that gltf doesn't have right they have you know, behaviors and spatial audio is already there and so there are benefits to the formats but they're different, they have different benefits to themselves. Um, I guess if I could wave a wand, you know, better interoperability tools are great. It's great to see um, Adobe's efforts in the, the USD to GLTF interoperability in the Kronos group and, and people here in the MSF. So uh, gosh, if I could wave my wand, I would love to see actually transmission and volume in USD preview surface. I know it can't change because it's kind of, maybe it's a version two of that that supports more things, uh, but I would love to see more parity between the two leading interactive formats, which are you know USDZ and GLTF, and how can we get more parity between them? Because you lose a lot, you transfer between one and the other. Yep, thanks. So, folks, maybe we have time for one more question if there's another question for Eric. All right. Well, Eric, thank you again. Appreciate the presentation. Love the conversation. Yep. And oh, thanks to Lassie for, uh, for organizing this. That was great.